We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I just, I'm, I'm completely speechless about what is happening in the world right now, and I'm sure you guys are uh, as well at home, just, maybe not speechless is the right word, but I think, are you in shock, and are you feeling a little disturbed, are you Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you upset? When you get the chance, let us know how you're feeling at home because I sure know how I feel, which is a lot of internal turmoil. I definitely just woke up very sad, both like Saturday and Sunday. I think after the week, it like sunk in and I just felt like overwhelming sadness when I woke up on Saturday. That was kind of how I would describe it and just... I don't know, I spent a lot of time talking today to various friends, but including one of our best friends that is Black. And she went to like some of the protests in DC and was more like the peaceful ones in cars and stuff. And I think like no matter your opinion on protests, I think at the ultimate end of this though, there's just this feeling of like hopelessness that has come from it. And just this sense that like things are not equal and it's really shining in these last couple months. Like I think we've all known that for a while. But I think with coronavirus, like having like an uneven distribution on people of color and then just all like the police brutalities that have happened, it's just, yeah, it's really sad, everything about it. And I want to say his name, George Floyd. I want to say his name over and over again, because I think we need to recognize that 
this is reality of, of America. And I've come to the realization that I've just been neutral for way yeah. too long mm -hmm. because it didn't pertain to me. When I read the description of privilege, which I have on my phone right now, because it's a constant reminder of the privilege I experience, even though I am not white American. Um, privilege is when you think something is not a problem because it's not a problem to you personally. And I feel that statement quite a bit this week because I think the privilege privilege I've experienced is exactly that, that if it doesn't pertain to me, then I don't need to get involved. I don't need to voice my opinion. But what I'm hearing this week is if we don't get involved, especially the people who this doesn't pertain to, yeah. then this will never be resolved. This will always be an issue for Americans. And unfortunately, it has come to what we see today. And I'm looking outside my window right now, Julie, there's just demonstrators outside my window who are peacefully protesting right now. But last night, I saw guns. I People were wow. out yep. um, looting. Uh, the storefronts were shattered. What I see in the news right now is George Floyd's name tied to the violent riots. And that's not what we need to do right now. Those two should not be in the same sentence together. Right. I don't want, I'm sick of seeing the two, even you know, on the news headlines, it's like we need to address the core issue here, which is racism in America that we all have inside of us. Absolutely. And like, there is actually this really great piece by um, Chris Como. Did you see this? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was basically talking about like the tale of two cities that is America today and just how we live drastically different lives. And I think I'm with you, UA. It's like, I definitely grew up in like a more sheltered environment that was very racially segregated in Massachusetts. Like Boston's a very segregated city. And I think it's challenging because people don't know what they don't know. And a lot of times mm -hmm. like they don't know what they're doing is wrong. And I agree with you. It's like when you're not saying something that is wrong, but you don't mm -hmm. know that. And I think when I've like been listening to, I've been just in like a deep hole of videos and written work and all that today. And I think what's been loud and clear is like the minority needs the majority to speak because one, it's like that's the only way change will happen. And then also it's just like, everyone's tired and burnt out and really just like struggling with this and you it's hard to do like both at the same time right so i think yeah like as someone that's white i need to like make sure that i'm not just being like oh i'm not racist but i'm anti-racist and i think that's really what yes. it comes out as we have to use our platforms i mean you and i built this platform to share different perspectives mm -hmm. and to learn and i want us to use this platform to make it very clear where where we stand which is we are absolutely anti-racism we are we want to fight racism and we want to fight the innate biases that we have in ourselves as well and i recognize what i think and what i grew up thinking and how i can combat that but i also have to say that i'm just trying to find ways to relate to what's going mm -hmm. on because even though it's not about me it's still that's the only way i can figure it out right yeah. like what what our black american feeling today and I although I will never know at least I know this one bit is like you know that feeling like we've all been bullied in school or a lot of us have been bullied in school the worst moment it's not when you get bullied or being called names it's when you get bullied and your friends don't help you or they don't stand up for you or defend you and that is a point that is being made right now it's not the perpetrator it's not like a faulting um the police officer, which they absolutely are at fault, but the the core of the problem is we're not standing with our black brothers and sisters. Yeah. So that's where we need to stand up right now. Is like we need to show that we are we are here to fight together. Absolutely, and it's crazy because it's something we've seen on the podcast too. Like even before this, it's I mean not to the same degree, obviously, but we had episodes about like dating as black women and yes. sexual race and stuff that was said on those episodes was shocking in 2020. I mean, 
I think we've come a like there's definitely been progress with racism for sure like since our parents generation but it's not the level of progress that needs to be happening in mm -hmm. the world today like the fact that there's just such mistreatment and all of that and only blame ignorance so much like I think there's mm -hmm. ignorance and not knowing what to say in some situations versus like outright saying things that are offensive that you know are Absolutely. wrong but like the fact that it's on dating apps like the fact that it's everywhere it just means that it's the mindset overall that needs to shift. And I think like for people that like when I was reading some of the stuff today, like for people that are parents that are listening to this podcast, because we do get parents that listen. Yes. I think this is where it starts. It's like I was listening to this one woman that was talking about like how her children like get not bullied, but you know, like these little tiny like micro bulliisms yes. of like, oh, why does your hair look that way? And it's like kids mm -hmm. that they would describe as nice. And the mm -hmm. problem is that they just don't understand. And I think it really starts with parents like showing that like everyone is beautiful and everyone should be loved no matter their shape, their size, like what they look like, their color, all of that. And I think that's where it really starts to make a big difference because I think every generation that comes in helps, but it's really like... I'm in a way I'm glad there's protests like I know it's a mixed bag like we've talked about but it does at least bring awareness to what's happening and my friend that I was talking to our mutual friend who's black she mentioned like she just doesn't feel like this will do enough change and it probably mm. won't is the reality but I think the fact that it's making people that aren't black that are in the majority or like you I guess like I don't know if this is okay to say but like I feel like Asian people are considered my like the model like ethnicity right For it's like sure. the model minority I am not saying that you don't face anything but with coronavirus there was definitely a lot of like hatred mm -hmm. to Asians so I think it, it brings to light that we all need to have each other's backs like you said earlier really the intensity of the issue was made very clear to me this week is that I face all sorts of discrimination, racist comments and behaviors throughout my life, but I've never felt that my life was threatened. Yeah. And I think that's the extent that we all need to understand is that sure, we've all like been made fun of or uh, been stereotyped. But when you wake up every day fearing for your life, that takes it to a whole new level. And that's where they they really need our support to to say this is not OK. This is absolutely not OK. And I also want to say that just because Julie and I have a podcast and just because so and so has a show on TV, just because so-and-so wrote a book doesn't mean that we know everything and I, I think this is where I have to just open this up and say we are just learning ourselves as well the only logical step right now is to educate ourselves on what is happening learn about the history and we don't know that we don't know everything and that we can learn to know more yeah well one of the things that I read today that was really assuring that was like okay you don't have to get it all right today as mm -hmm. long as you are trying to get there and you're trying to show support and that's like the best thing that people can be doing right now just showing up and accepting people and loving people and i think like yeah with this podcast like that's been something that's been so core to our mission and that's been in the dating and relationship realm but it goes way deeper than that right it's like humanity as a whole it's not just relationships with each other it's relationships to our society and all of that yeah you know um when we went to south by southwest last week or last when last we went week, to south by wish. last week <laughs> in my mind last week when we went to south by southwest last year there were so many panels about diversity inclusion and yeah. companies and what we really took away was if you want your institution if you want your life to to embrace diversity you got to live that diversity which means look at the friends around you are do they re represent not just different colors but do they represent different perspectives yep and that's diversity that's living and breathing diversity you can't just say i have like one token black friend one token indian friend and then one token republican friend like that's that's your <laughs> diversity you got to live it because you you have to have these conversations and i i'm i'm glad that we're at a point where at least we have a platform to have these conversations and if you have a platform use your influence to speak up this is the time 
time to do it. Yeah, and I mean, relating it back to dating, because we can't forget why we're here. We are here for the Dateable Podcast. But one of the things that makes us challenge our views and grow as people is to hear different perspectives. Like if we Mm -hmm. heard from just all like white women that were 25 to 28, for example, right? Like we would have a echo chamber of like the same ideas and perceptions and a lot of times like we'll throw on guests here and this is not like do with race it's just like pers like point of view and people are like why did you have that guess like they weren't right like what they said and we're like no the point is that even if you don't agree with them there's something about learning and listening to different people and that's what makes like a rich experience for yourself and really gives you the tools and viewpoints to go out in this world and figure out what works for you if you just have one view and one way of knowing people and i actually think this goes a hundred percent back to the issue at hand is a lot of the problem is that people in certain parts of this country just are around all white people and they just see the news for example and that's the problem is like they're not like rooted in reality it's rooted in like media and perception which it's a shame like i wish people had more outlets they could get diverse perspectives because i think that would really help humanize everyone there's similar values and similar ch- like things that everyone's going through no matter what your race or color that's what empathy is yeah So we're going to do something a little different this week. Uh, Originally, we had the future of sex toys with Laura DiCarlo. So we'll save that for next week. But what we did is a compilation of a couple of our past episodes. So we clipped a couple areas and you can listen to the full episodes. We'll leave them at the end and in the show notes too. But we wanted to really focus on some of our past Black guests and just the struggles that they've shared with us about dating in modern times as Black people. Mm -hmm. So again, this goes into everyday life. It goes into dating. Like I think like if you're a person of color, you're probably going to just be nodding your head Mm -hmm. and being like, yep, I get it. But then if you're not, hopefully, like I know for me, it definitely helped to just hear people's struggles and really just give us a new lens every time we're looking at dating and what other people might be going through. So absolutely. Let's hear it from Yulitsa and Sophia to kick it off with some of the struggles that they face as dating as Black women in modern times. I know we've talked about dating as an Asian person in modern times and also the fetishes that come with that. We talked about yellow fever. We also talked about the white horse. But we had someone write us in on Twitter. Um, Her name is Yalitza. And she said, you know, there hasn't been an episode about black fetishism and racism experience while dating as a black person. I would kill for a breakdown on that. And here she is. (laughs) So she volunteered herself by writing that, basically. (laughs) But also brought a friend along. Sophia is also on the phone. Um, Do you girls want to say a quick hello? Hi, everyone. (laughs) So just a little background on both of them. Yalitza's currently in Cincinnati. She's moving soon. She grew up in New York City in her early 20s. She's single and ready to mingle. I'm guessing. <laughs> oh, sure. Let's say that. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> and Sophia is currently living in Atlanta. She's originally from Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, I know what that's like. I lived in <laughs> Connecticut for a little bit. Uh, she's, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Yep. She's 26 years old and currently in a monogamous relationship. Okay, so I love it. We have we have someone who's single and then someone who's in a committed relationship talking about what it's like dating in modern times as a black woman. Let's just go very general first. What is it like dating as a black woman these days? I don't, Sophia, where do we start? <laughs> I know. Um, what it boils down to is that we, we have all, all of the struggles that everyone else has to deal with in general, but of course there are going to be particular things in addition to that that we have to think about and navigate through. And so dealing with not only sexism, but the racism on top of each other. And I don't want to speak for other Black women, Black femmes, mm-hmm. but in the conversations I've had with peers and in general, the conversations you see online and when you bring people together, there are shared experiences of being treated differently because of 
your race um, as a black woman, the way that you look as a black woman, the different skin tones and hair textures that we have. And just we we share so many common stories of things that men have said to us about our appearance or their preferences for dating. OK, so, sharing yeah. is caring. So <laughs> what are those? <laughs> Tell us. Oh, man. Us. I will say like on Tinder, yeah. you'll get a lot of messages where it's like, I've never been with a black girl before. Oh, or yeah. they'll call you like, hey, beautiful black goddess or yeah, chocolate man. queen. Um, beautiful Nubian I know- princess. <laughs> and how do you feel when you get messages like that? It's, it's an a, automatic turn off. Yeah, a large eye roll is what we'll say. I mean, I um, can I can totally relate because I get those messages as well. Like you're, uh, I've never had an Asian before. Like what? Are yeah. you at a fucking buffet? <laughs> <You know? laughs> we are not here for you oh, to try. Really? Like people yeah. of different backgrounds and cultures are not for you to sample. But, That's not but, what we exist for. So my question is, do you think that comes out of racism or is that just ignorance? The common conversations that we've had are all they're not necessarily centered around racism because a lot of times there's not really a malicious intent to it, but there's, there's a bit of a a sensitivity. Well, racism in and of itself is ignorance. So I would have to say, yeah, (laughs) Um, whether it's intended to be negative, like it's not about the intent, it's about the impact. So if you're saying something that is in its impact racist, it is racism. So I want to bring this back to a, a few statistics that I've seen online. I guess I don't have the exact statistics, but there's been a, a lot of studies and reports on um, marginalized groups who have the worst time with online dating. And those would be yeah. Asian men and black women. Black women. Yep. Why do you think Asian men and black women fall into this group? It's well, because of the stereotypes that are yeah. associated with those groups of people. What are those At the stereotypes? End of the day, Oh, well, for black women in particular, we're hard to deal with. We're loud. We're not very aggressive. docile. We, aggressive is a good one. Mm. Um, we have our own mind. We do what we want. And Single we're going to be female. difficult to take. The, In 2018, we saw the rise of the conversation around Asian um, identity in media. And I think BuzzFeed, I don't know which platform it did, but they did a Asian men are sexy too type of campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, because that, a lot yeah. of, oftentimes, like Asian males have not been portrayed positively in Western society, like in our media, like at all as like potential love interests. They're either sidekicks or they're not visible at all. Yeah. Mm. So speaking, because I can only speak from the Asian side, a lot of my Asian male friends will say, you know, it's hard for us dating because not only do non-Asians don't want to date us because we're not um, masculine enough based on, you know, media stereotypes, but also our own kind don't want to date us. They rather oh. date outside of our, race, of, of our race. Do you feel the same way or do you, how do you feel about that for you? <laughs> so the first thing that I will say that encompasses that experience for black women is every black, I, I'm going to say every black girl has had to ask at some point in their life, I wonder if they like black girls. Mm. Oh, I remember doing this. I was like talking to one of our friends. I was like, he's really cute. I like him. Do you think he likes black girls? Because you, you, you never get to just walk in the world and think that you are desirable. Like, it doesn't matter how you look as a black woman. You could be, you know, on point, your eyebrows on fleek, your outfit is fit. And you, you know that you're beautiful, but you still have to ask yourself. Would you have to ask that for black men too? Yes. Yes. So you, you, would, you would see a black man and be like, I wonder if he dates black women? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why, why is that? You see it. You don't, you don't even have to ask. And you see the black boys not interact with the black girls to the same capacity they do their peers of other races. You never really see them interacting with you or they never have an interest in you. And I'm not the type of person to, you know, chase what doesn't want me, like checking for people who check for you. So you just know. And it's often, it's expressed in media, it's expressed online. Like black yeah. girls, I've had people I know who know people, or like I've heard met them say, I don't like black girls. And they are black. Is it a look that the media portrays that says she should look a certain way? Or is it more of a status thing? Is it like if you have a, mm-hmm. a wife who is not of your same race, then somehow you're elevated in status? That's actually well, what I wanted to bring it back to because I was going to comment on how for a long time, for a lot of men of color, particularly black men, having a white partner is a status symbol. Mm. Um, just a couple of years ago, an artist did a piece, a performance piece, where he was wearing white women as scarves <laughs> in order to like <laughs> convey this message of how 
a lot of people use them as status symbols of like, look, I've attained such wealth. I've attained such growth. I've escaped, you know, all these, I've, mm. I've uh, transcended my blackness. I now have a white partner. This, this is like, this is a symbol of my power. Interesting. Do you think that it has any, cause I know we talked about how black women are often seen as marginalized, but black men are almost elevated in media. Like in Insecure, oh, yeah. that TV show, like there was this whole scene about like how these two white women really wanted to like have a black man. Like, do you see but that? But that's not in even elevate. That's more fetishizing. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fetishizing. fetishizing. For mm. the color of their skin, for like the like the mandingo stereotype, all these tropes that our society has placed on them of like this powerful black man and trapping them into this idea that there's only one way to be masculine or be a black man. It's more stifling than it is empowering. So I, I want to bring this back to some of your personal experiences, because what I'm hearing is you're either experiencing meeting someone who may not date black women or meeting someone who fetishizes dating black women. So how do you navigate the dating scene? So Faye, you're in a relationship. How are you able to navigate these two polarizing effects? So my boyfriend is white. Okay. Um, we're going we're gonna to start off by making that absolutely clear. And that's going <laughs> to paint a lot of my experiences here. I'm not the first person of color that he's dated. I am the first black person that he's dated. Okay. Um, and so he's more liberal. He, I mean, he grew up in a really conservative family in the deep South, but like he has a set of experiences growing up, but then going to college and meet in the people that he's met, that he's kind of, um, a better one. <laughs> we'll say there's <laughs> he's a, a woke why wife. Made this far. We have a lot of conversations about these types of things, but like a lot of his friends tell him he, or they're really surprised when they're spacing my photo and they're like, wow, you don't seem like the type of dude to date a black girl oh. not like in kind of like a joking kind of way like not in like a you don't seem like the kind of guy in a hostile way but like oh wow I didn't expect this mm. you're the whitest guy I know kind of status and so it, it kind of sparked a conversation where it's like every time we see an interracial couple in public which he notices them now um he's like does he seem like the type of guy that would date a black girl? <laughs> and so <laughs> you know you know what's time. interesting about this conversation is that a lot of my non-black male friends have this, uh, I don't know, the stereotype or this myth that black women don't date outside of the race. They're like, I don't even approach black women because I just assume they wouldn't even look my way. If you look at the statistics, it's not wrong, but it's a, it's a sweeping generalization. Black women do date outside their race, just not to the degree that black men do. But it's mm -hmm. never good to make assumptions. So right. I guess back to my original question is how do you date successfully then? Like when you first, Sophia, when you first met your boyfriend, I'm sure mm -hmm. you had suspicions, right? So what are those conversations you had to have to get over that? I met James on Bumble. Okay. And that was key. Because the only way that that conversation would have started was if we both swiped right. Uh -huh. So the dating apps, to me, the Tinder and the Bumbles were game changing because it eliminates a lot of the, hey, this is my classmate. He's kind of cute. Let me ask my friend of a friend. Let me kind of like wink at him and hope that he like, uh. it, it just like, it makes it clear from the beginning. I am interested and you are interested and we can start having this conversation. How early in your relationship did you have the discussion of, have you dated black women before? Um, that's a good question. I don't think that was something I ever brought up point blank so much. It was an extension of a story of like the first person that saw my picture and was like, Oh, I didn't know your girlfriend was black. Oh. And he's, and then he like continued to just be like, well, it's not the first time I've dated a person of color or Oh, my other girlfriend, like, and, and it would just open up the conversation that we would be talking about it anyway. And so those types of details would come out because they were relevant to the conversation. Um, so Safaya, you live in Atlanta, because in Atlanta, that's, you know, the black Mecca, do you get any sort of reverse discrimination, comments or criticism from from the black community? I will say that this is a good place to be an interracial couple in terms of like not getting weird looks on the street. Um, I'll say that I have seen a lot of interracial mingling in Atlanta. It, it does like make sense that that kind of thing would happen here because it's, I mean, it's it's a growing city with a lot of transplants from the different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And so, um, but that's but, not to say it doesn't happen at all. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, just, I just don't Williams. know of it. Like, those are things that are, are happening not to my face. 
Okay. We had a guy that we spoke with that had dated a black woman. And we had talked to him about this experience. And he said that he actually felt like people saw him more woke after doing this. (laughs) What are your thoughts on that? (laughs) That's... Oh no, that's, that's, that's oh my God, that's one of my fears when it comes to dating outside of my race is being used as like, and this is why I'm really selective with my friendships. I never want to be that black friend that white people use as like, well, I have a black friend, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't want to be the black girlfriend that the white guy uses as like, well, I can't be racist because I'm dating a black person. Uh, ah, yeah. okay. It's like, yeah, it's like a superpower. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I never want to fall into that. And so people perceiving you as more, listen, you can be just as racist and date people of color as you can when you don't date them. It doesn't matter. And what about you, Yalitza? Because you're dating, uh, you're single. So what do you do to filter men? Oh, man. So my challenge is trying to find someone who isn't racist, isn't sexist, is like in the same direction as me. So I look at their profile and I obviously look for red flags in the way that they communicate with me. Um, I ask specific, I I drive the conversation so I can get a feel for their politics a bit. Those are really important things to me. I need to understand where you stand on the spectrum of, you know, liberal to conservative and like whether Mm -hmm. or not we'll vibe. And so what I do is I often talk about myself. Like I bring up my activism in college or the work that I do with young girls of color. I talk about, you know, like, because my work is based in race. So if they're uncomfortable with that conversation, I can already tell that this is not going to go well if we try to pursue a relationship or go on more dates. Okay. And then wh- what are some red flags that you can see right from the beginning, other than politics? Their friend group, seeing like, you know, looking at photos of their friends and like what they do for for their interests. Like if I don't see di- a diverse friend group, that's a red flag for me because yeah. I need to know that you're having certain conversations with your peers. And like, I need to know that you've been exposed to different types of people. Mm-hmm. Okay. So friend groups, what else? For me, based on like my profile and the fact that they can see my Instagram and what I've, when I do and what I'm interested in, what I talk about, people pretty much read themselves out. So I don't get a lot of, you know, I don't have to sift that much. I don't have to do a lot of fine tuning. But but you can, right? Because I mean, speaking from girl to girl, I, I stalk profiles before I meet them in person. <laughs> yeah. and, and sometimes I'm like, That's dude, this man. guy, this guy, every ex-girlfriend he's had is Asian. That's a red flag to me. Yeah, that, well, that actually, I do see that. But is but that a red flag to you? I've never had an experience where um, I was one of several black women that someone had dated. So what are some examples of fetishism then that you've seen? Like the other flip oh, side. Man. Those, so, those types of things t- tend to happen in the first few messages. So it's yeah. very easy to kind of like, well, so much for that. And then like block them. Give us some examples. So, so I was seeing an African-American boy back in between um, sophomore year and junior year of college. And this goes back to like the types of comments that we'll hear from African-American men about black women. Um, and he had told me that his dad said, oh, she's really pretty for a Haitian girl. And I was like, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? You could have just said I was pretty, but then it was like, layered Mm -hmm. in terms of like the African diaspora of like now we're talking about my cultural identity as like a Haitian woman and like you not expecting Haitian women to look like this and what does that mean and all that kind of stuff. There's so many parallels with the black community and the Asian community because I've dated Asian men whose family's like oh she's really dark for an Asian. (laughs) Like what? 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 Yeah there's issues across diasporas within different ethnic groups. It's all rooted in the idea that we think beauty is supposed to to be, you know, the closest thing to the Eurocentric standard. And if you're not, if you're not fair skinned and you don't have hair that looks like this, you're not beautiful. I had a cousin who we were talking about how he often dated African-American girls with fair skin. And we asked him based on, based on our skin tone, um, his sister and his other cousin, who would you date? And he pointed to me and he said, you're good. And he pointed to his other cousin and said, you're good. And then he pointed to his own sister, who is the same skin tone as him, as his mother, as many other people in his family and said, you're too dark. Whoa. Whoa. Interesting. Wow. And that's a very real experience for a lot of black women. I haven't had that experience necessarily. So I live in, I'm in this space where I'm like black enough to be fetishized by like white men and still be acceptable to their family and also black enough to be considered black for black people, but also be fetishized because, you know, I'm, I'm not 
dark, dark skin or I have good hair. And so it's like, I don't know why you're dating me. Do you, are you dating me because you actually like me or because you think I'm some type of trophy because of how I look? So let's talk about that because I, I want to hear about, we we're talking about fetishizing, right? So mm-hmm. when was the last time you experienced that where you felt like someone really just felt like you were a novel to date? My last experience was with a white man and he would comment on my lips a lot. Mm. Like, you know, yeah. they're so full, they're so luscious, da, 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 da. And it just got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. No more dates. No more <laughs> oh, dates with you. Okay. So I know like one of the things that came out on our Twitter conversation is that you mentioned like one of our past guests made a point to say like that she wanted to experience all sorts of races and really have those experiences. And yeah. we didn't actually think much of it, but you guys had a very different perception that that was actually, I guess I'll let you speak for yourself. What was your perception of that comment? So I actually talked to Sophia about that. The reason why that was upsetting for me to hear is because as a black woman, people are always you know, willing to go on a date with you or experience you, but they're never willing to lock it down and commit to you. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you have a theory about this too with yeah. like Asian women and men. Oh, totally. I, I, I feel or the same women. way. Like men will date Asian women and it's fun. It's novel. But then when it comes to marriage and having kids and introducing her to their families, it's a whole different story. So if I and I have seen so many stories online or from like our network where it's like, a black woman was with a man for like five years, wouldn't commit to her. Break up six months later, he's married to the next girl. This girl is notably like smaller, lighter skin, quiet. Mm. Um, okay. okay. All of the things that are like stereotypically wife material that a black woman stereotypically would not be. Okay, I want to talk about the stereotypes. First of all, where do we think these stereotypes came from? And second of all, what can we do to, to get rid of these stereotypes? Well, slavery. Is the root of everything. (laughs) The root of all evil is slavery. (laughs) Right. You think Uh, the angry black woman stereotype came from slavery? Well, if we go back to the basic tropes of black women is like the Mammy and the Jezebel. Got Explain what those are. Yeah, what does that mean? So the Mammy is, this is the African-American figure. She's like the matriarch of the household. She cooks, she cleans. That's She's a servant. She serves as a servant. And then the Jezebel is a sexually promiscuous woman. You know, she's running around in the streets late at night. Um, and that's something that was often put onto black women. And so black women are either seen as sexual or not sexual at all. And that's mm. it. Those are the two main tropes that came out of, you know, the ideas around people of color when we like <laughs> participated in an incredibly racist structure in our society. But what about the anger, the anger part? Where did that come from? It's through the media, like how yeah. the media portrays people like women of color, each group is portrayed specifically by the media in a different way. Like Latinas are like sexy and spicy and hot. And then Asians are like docile and like smart and brainy, da, 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 da. And then black women ended up with the angry, you know, welfare queen, um, baby daddy drama. Like when you, when you take a step back and look at those descriptions again, like the description for Asians and the descriptions for Latinas are descriptions that are more attractive in a dating space. No one's going to be like, Ooh, I want someone who's just mean. You know, <laughs> it, We kind of just, we got shafted. Well, what about the positive stereotypes? Cause I think there's also a subculture, like one of our best friends is black as well. And everyone just assumes she's like fun and very bubbly personality and dances all the time. And like all the stereotypes that are from media that way, how would you respond to that? Well, black women don't often get to be seen having multiple layers. Like we don't get to be seen as soft. We don't get to be seen as emotional. We're always portrayed as like strong, independent, powerful, angry, da, 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 da. And I think the way that we deconstruct that is by allowing people to be who they are (laughs) instead of placing them in these confined spaces of like, this is, this is how I see you. And this is the only way to see you and actually understanding people individually. So what I find really interesting for media perspective is that the more these stereotypes come out, the more complaints that come out, the more these movies and TV shows are made in response to it, but they kind of backfire. So I'll give you an example. I had this conversation with a few of my girlfriends and two of them are black. And we were talking about that show being Mary Jane. Have you seen Oh, I don't like that show. I don't (laughs) watch it. Okay. It's a show made by black women who wanted a show about empowering the uh, like black women in the dating world too. But in the show, as the, as the seasons go on, 
the women get angry and angrier and more independent. And then by the end, they're kind of like, I don't need men in my life. So my girlfriends were saying, you know, like, I love that there's a show created for us, but at the same time, it actually feeds into the stereotype. Well, the but it gets like- rating. Like there's no incentive for Hollywood to wipe away these stereotypes that have been making their m- money for all of these years. But there's one more thing to add to that, which is the fact that if people are upset with um, the portrayal, it's because there aren't enough. If we like, if we count up all the shows that we have where there's representation, of course we're going to feel some type of way if Mary Jane has all these characters that are being portrayed as angry and independent because we don't have enough characters to show all the different sides that Black women have. So what about Insecure? Because I feel like they've been kind of taking this on too. Mm -hmm. Like Issa Rae's whole thing has been like, how am I portrayed as an educated Black woman? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that show and the message that's coming there? Insecure is great, but it's one show. That's really what it boils down to. Well, what, what we need, is, yeah. What do you think it's about that show that's that has had you have this reaction? This is great. We're the one I forget the name that being you, Mary Jane. being Mary Jane that you just represented. So it's like, I hate that show. Like, what's the, <laughs> I don't, yeah, Insecure is more for the younger millennial black folks. It shows all the nuance of the date of dating while black and and you know figuring out life, which is why so many people are drawn to it. You get to see the different insights of the characters, and it's like addressing all these different things. Like I love Molly's that. Di- like the dialogue around Molly and her experience with Dro and being this really successful black woman who has it all together, but yet cannot for the life of her figure out her dating situation. That resonates with me because that's how a lot of people feel. And that's where a lot of people are in life. So Insecure has really artfully done a great job of representing the different places that a lot of young black millennials are in life and showing our different sides. So do you think that's the difference then that's multidimensional? It's not one stereotype where this other being Mary Jane is an angry black female. I would say, yeah, but I also haven't seen being Mary Jane, so I can't speak on it fully. For a show like Insecure, what I find so intriguing about it is that the characters are so relatable, no matter what gender or what race you are, they just happen to be black, right? So it's like, Mm -hmm. these are, these are, these are normal human beings going through normal human things. And they just happen to be of a certain color, but a show like being Mary Jane, and I, I would criticize Tyler Perry in the same realm. The the leading factor is that they're black characters. I don't know. Insecure that it is based around being black. Like their that race is... and identity definitely does play a role in Insecure. But I will agree with you that like in Tyler Perry productions, we don't talk about Tyler Perry. It's a bit <laughs> heavy-handed. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> what, we don't. What, what what is it about him? Yeah, what, what is, is it? it? Yeah, I want to hear. It. Tyler Perry has a lot of caricatures in his character lineup that are not always helpful. And because of the sheer popularity of his movies and how ubiquitous it is to see them on your screens. And so it's kind of like he's it's dangerous because of just how popular it is. It is what it is. So basically uh, what you're saying is that there's a very stereotypical character he portrays. Like, like he, he always could, has a dark-skinned black man that does a black woman wrong and then the light-skinned savior comes in <laughs> and he loves Jesus <laughs> and he saves the black woman. Got like it's, it. it's the same thing. Got it. <laughs> So I think like, I think what I'm hearing from this whole conversation is like, we just have to stop with these like stereotypes that have persisted and just like let people be people like any other race. But I, and but the, what I'm also hearing from this is that it comes from within your own community. I face these battles in my own community and Asians actually perpetuate these stereotypes for ourselves. And I, f- I feel like it's the same in the black community. Yeah, ho- the horizontal hostility, internalized racism happens mm-hmm. in a lot of different ethnic groups. And we do have to address it from within. It's challenging when we don't have the voice or the capacity to do it. Like we're all trying to fight. We're all trying to fight racism, but then we're all trying to fight racism and then sexism. And then within our own community, and then homophobia and then transphobia. And then uh, da, da, there's so many things <laughs> and it's hard to do them all. So then, ladies, help me out here. So I have a lot of men, of men friends, male friends. (laughs) I have a lot of men, guys. I I just want to tell you guys that. I have a lot of male friends who are very much willing to date outside their race. In fact, they're just like, I will, I will date anybody awesome. But they are the, um, they feel most insecure 
when approaching black women, especially online. They, they're like, I mm-hmm. don't want to offend Good. Her. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to offend her. I want to be sensitive and I don't want to feel, I don't want to come off like this is some sort of like fetishism. Yeah. My advice is this. If you're a white person and you want to date a black person exactly the way that you would reproach her if she was white, do the same thing. My issues came when like, I guess, like, I mean, especially because I, I do, like, go out with a lot of white guys, and it's just kind of, like, always doing the most every time. Like, and, and it goes on both sides. Sometimes it's the most in, like, a fetishizing kind of way. Sometimes it's the most of, like, hey, I'm aware that we are of different skin tones, and I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that I accommodate and make this as smooth and easy as possible. And us, it's like, you just said a bunch of words. Um, can you not? <laughs> just be cool. Okay. Just be normal. Right. Okay. So from the guy, from the male perspective, you're saying just treat everybody the same, you know, however you, uh, you, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I want to hear this. Uh, I I will say you do have to do a level of education. Like if you want to date this person, do not expect this person to educate you about things and like, be mindful, like don't overthink it, but be aware and don't Mm -hmm. get offended if you do like, and don't get offended if they do tell you that you've done something wrong. It, Cause it's all about intent. Like we know that you're not trying to be, you know, racist, but like when we tell you something, don't get defensive. I've, I've addressed white men when they say like, when I say, please don't call me chocolate princess. It's like, this is a compliment. It's like, no, yeah. we're not doing yeah. that. So yeah. That yeah you gotta, like, yeah, you gotta communicate. But like, so we're actually like kind of on the same page here. Cause what I, what might be normal thing was like to the initial approach. Also, you would never say chocolate princess to a white person. So it's kind of like, okay, right. I like, I like, like white chocolate, <laughs> white chocolate princess. <laughs> I always, chocolate princess always gets to me because there are plenty of like Southeast Asians and people from India that have the same, like, kind of like maybe more yellow undertones, but like are also brown. And I asked myself, has anyone ever called you a chocolate princess? Let's hold that thought for a sec. We'll get right back to it. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to ViaHemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's ViaHemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash datable. That is armoire.style, spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month. 
and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armoire today. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over over $60. So head to OSEAMalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Next, we heard from Chris, who actually reached out to us in response to Yalitza and Safaya's episode to share his own story. So this is what he wrote. As a black gay man who's dated in both the Bay Area and the East Coast, Philadelphia and Florida mostly, I found that my race has greatly complicated my romantic life. One of my first Tinder matches ever said, I'm sorry, but I don't find African Americans attractive. When I eventually started using gay hookup apps like Grindr, I was surprised how many guys listed no blacks, no femmes, no Asians on their profiles. Shortly before moving here from Philly, a close friend who I had started developing feelings for drunkenly told me that he had a racial totem pole with blacks in the second lowest position only above Asians. The few times I confronted someone about their sexual racism, they would always say some variation of, sorry, it's just a preference. When I moved to the Bay Area, I started experiencing the opposite problem. People often fetishizes me for my race. You look like a Greek god made out of chocolate. I love how full your lips are. And show me that BBC big black cock are all openers I've gotten on dating apps. I told some guys that I prefer not to be fetishized, but most don't understand what the issue is. My favorite response, it's not a fetish. I can't even come without a black dude in the room. So in this episode, we dove a little deeper into the meaning of sexual racism, which is defined as an individual's sexual preference for specific races. It's an inclination towards or against potential sexual or romantic partners on the basis of perceived racial identity. So we're going to pick up the conversation right Right after Chris tells us about his experience, and we open up a discussion about what are some ways we can address the issue at hand. So Chris, at the time of recording, was 26 years old, lived in Berkeley, California, grew up in Florida, and single and actively going on dates. Let's hear more from Chris. How do we navigate around this? Like, what is something, what have you been thinking about in terms of how you can improve your dating? Because there's nothing, we can't change other people, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. what is it you can change about how you're dating that can make this experience better? Yeah, so I really try to have conversations um, about race with anyone I'm sort of like dating seriously. So especially like when that guy was like, ah, it's not a fetish. Like I I actually made a point to say, no, that like is a fetish and this is yeah. what a fetish is. You know, I can't change people. Like I used to be bitter about all of this, but like that, that's there's not no productive. There's no point. Yeah, yeah, there's no, yeah. So me just like engaging in conversations when someone says something that's slightly off, not to make a big deal about it, but just say, hey, by the way, like that's not that cool. That's a really great way to like approach it too, because I've been in those situations and it hasn't actually even been like myself per se. It was like with another white female and she was taught like made a really off colored comment about like gay men. Mm -hmm. And like it was like one of those moments that I was like, I should say something, but you didn't know how far you should step it, especially with someone you don't know well. Mm -hmm. But I think that really is the only way to like help educate Mm -hmm. people. And you don't have to do it in like a why would you say that? Yeah, it's like a. 
hey, like, actually, you know, like, those types of comments, like, aren't mm-hmm. okay anymore. Not okay. Yeah, no, um, so this isn't the context of another game, man, but it was actually one of my co-workers. Uh, mm-hmm. We were at, like, a, a work retreat, and I don't remember how the conversation started, but she, she was describing her ideal man, and one of the characteristics was white. And I kind of winced a little bit, and she's like, what, wait, what, what? And I was like, well, you know, you're kind of feeding into white supremacy when you right. say that. And, she, and then we had, you know, uh, not too long of a conversation, but, like, a conversation. She was very uncomfortable mm-hmm. uh, but i think that's you know she'll think about it next time she yeah. starts listing all those characteristics she might you know think twice about saying white <laughs> um, yeah I, yeah I, it's yeah. one of those things because i know it's like it's been a debate it's like oh like if i say this point of view like mm-hmm. are they even gonna like listen because they obviously think about it. i think this one the one she said i think that actually probably would stick because it was mm-hmm. like it felt like it was very subconscious that yeah, she was yeah. even yeah, saying yeah, it exactly. mm-hmm. but i think like like the example i gave like that girl was blatantly saying something like offensive yeah. that's what's like conflicted with me I'm like is it even worth my time saying something mm-hmm. is like if some can I change someone's opinion but I think yeah. in retrospect if this was to happen again I would absolutely say something mm-hmm. because it's like that is the only thing you can do Yeah, I feel like people are confused because mm-hmm. there is a level of sensitivity that keeps increasing mm-hmm. with everything we're saying now I mean I basically like I feel like I can't say anything anymore yeah. without yeah. offending someone right mm-hmm. yeah so there was like that big debate back a couple years ago with where at like restaurants, if they were ident- identifying tables mm. and they would say, oh, that's a table with the black people, that's mm. a table with the Asians. Mm-hmm. And this was exposed and yeah. all of a sudden Oof. that wasn't okay, <laughs> yeah. right? But then at the same time, isn't it easier to identify people yeah. when you're running a business, you're just like need mm-hmm. a quick mm-hmm. identifier. Isn't it easier to just identify people by race? But when you're expressing preferences, why is it offensive to say my preference is a certain race? Not only are you offended Offending all the people who aren't that race, but mm-hmm. you're also offending all the people who are in yeah, that yeah. race <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you're putting them all in one category. Yeah. So it's kind of like that generalization mm-hmm. and stereotyping that's yeah. offensive. So it's like, where do you draw the line, right? Yeah. So to you, Chris, where do you draw the line? Where do you say, ah, it's okay that they put that on in their profile or mm-hmm. eh, that's where I draw the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The line is always fuzzy and I yeah. feel like it is moving sort of every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as it comes to dating and preferences... How I approach sort of my profiles and everything and how I would love for everyone else to do is talk about personal characteristics that are not attached to any sort of marginalized group. So like, you know, I like guys who are athletic and funny. Like, that's all great. Once you start saying, and white. Like, that's... (laughs) Yeah. And I like to sort of differentiate between sort of like personal racism and and systemic racism. And a lot Mm. of people will just say an offhand comment like that and say, like, I didn't mean anything by it. But that all also feeds into this larger system. That's what I have the issue with, and that's why we all have to change our behavior one by one. I just feel like our grandkids who are going to be listening to this episode like 20, 30 years or from now, Mm -hmm. they're going to be like, what the heck? Because by then, (laughs) everyone's mixed. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's pretty much tinted, (laughs) you know, a little bit tan, a little bit brown. amazing. And it's just nobody's going to be talking about race anymore. I can't wait for us to get to that But I will say, as far as we still need to go, which we definitely do if you're getting comments like this, like, yeah. clearly we're not That's there yet insane. but I will say if we look at like our parents generation it was yeah. like so Way much worse. worse like people just weren't even conversing like my parents like I was raised Jewish like they only would date or socialize or talk to other Jews yeah. like It's come a long way. Like the fact that there is interracial dating, the fact that we are having open conversations actually is a lot more than where we were. That's true. Yeah, we've made progress. We can still keep making progress. And the only way to do that is to call people out, right? Mm -hmm. I think the people who are open to change are open to these comments as well or feedback. Let's just, feedback (laughs) is a good word. Mm -hmm. Giving you some feedback. Also, if they don't react, if they do fight you or like they're like, no, I am right. Like that Mm -hmm. is their opinion. But I think what you said like hopefully later on Mm -hmm. as they're talking again or Mm -hmm. like they're thinking it over later on in the day it will like remember okay like let me at least give this some thought and yeah should this be my thought pattern or not? Absolutely. So what are you looking for, Chris? Are you looking for a long-term serious relationship? Monogamy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, like, Some grinder <laughs> action. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sort of, um, you know, initially I was looking for sort of a long-term relationship. I was approaching every interaction like a potential long relationship that wasn't working out. <laughs> um, so naive. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I more have the opinion now of just like interacting with people and 
and seeing where they're at and what they want and just being open to a whole sort of range of things as a single person you know every once in a while i go on grinder for a hookup because you know <laughs> that's, that's what you do yeah, you got yeah, your needs exactly yeah um and then you know i'll go on like dates with other people that you know maybe it looks like a more long-term thing that may or may not work out yeah so i'm i'm looking for a range of things depending on you know where the other person is so you're pretty open to yes. whatever yeah. you're mm-hmm. looking for a connection of some sort exactly yeah so what are some of the struggles you have now where are you finding people to date? Yeah, I'm I'm mostly like again using the apps just because I feel like that's the that's the easiest way to meet people nowadays. Mm-hmm. There's such a con- mm-hmm. like a small amount of people that we actually meet in our everyday lives. Yeah, as far as trouble, um, I I don't think I get that many matches on like dating apps. I mm. do use stuff other than Grinder, <laughs> so like I'm on uh, Tinder and OkCupid and, and, and things like that. For a while, OkCupid was doing all this really cool research yeah. where they looked at like yeah. response rates of people of different races, and of course, you know, black men got yeah. more responses than than white men. That's and, interesting yeah. though, because so. I think like I know we spoke with the two black women that were on the show before, mm-hmm. and like it is a known fact that black women are at the same level as Asian men when it comes comes mm. to dating mm. apps, right? Like, what is it, like, least response rate? But yeah. I think yeah. at least my perception of black men was not the same. Yeah. So I think there's something in society that's almost, like, elevated black men. Like, some mm. of the stereotypes you were talking about before, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. the strong, like, once good-looking. You go black. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once exactly. you go black, you never <laughs> go back stereotypes. Like, there's a lot of, like, this, like, good-looking stereotype, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but it's also a fetish right it's yeah a, it's a fetishization and then also like i don't like i don't ascribe to that i'm not super aggressive i'm like you know i go to the gym but just for like looks <laughs> like okay. I'm, I'm, yeah i'm not particularly <laughs> See, yeah. saying because like because of this stereotype where like like white people for example don't mm-hmm. have like they don't have like one stereotype exactly. as much yeah, yeah. you're saying basically because you don't fit this stereotype that's yeah. on movies and <laughs> yeah, yeah. tv shows yeah. then you're not seeing like that response rate yeah i had a fr- I, I had a first date where um the white guy like you know we matched we talked on tinder we met up um and he's like yeah you were a little more whitewashed than i you know would have thought and <sighs> i was like uh which i mean yeah, yeah i'm I'm not i'm not you know fitting those stereotypes and i, I don't really pretend to but i think you know they look yeah at my picture like if i have like a shirtless pic or something and they expect they want <laughs> you know, like a something. caricature exactly which yeah. is so and I'm not, interesting it's though so interesting. because white people like if you look at like celebrities like white celebrities mm-hmm. i'm thinking of like brad pitt matthew mcconaughey no white guys actually look like them either. Oh, yeah. hell no. Yeah, For exactly. whatever reason, <laughs> yeah. they're not like, oh, you didn't fit my like yeah. thought. For, like, why is you it different? Like Chris for, Hemsworth, but. Right. Like, why <laughs> yeah. is it different for black men? Because over... it's still the majority. You're still surrounded by white people all mm-hmm. the time. So, you know, there's various shapes and sizes of white people. And in media, too. They, they portray all those various shapes the, and sizes. And then, like, absolutely. as far as with minorities, there's these certain tropes. And we, we are getting, you know, further past that. Yeah. There are a lot we're making progress but I think still generally like white people are allowed to have like unique interests and, and likes and everything and black people are you use their color as right. as the main characteristic they, use ba- like, they yeah. like basketball and hip hop <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I love hip hop I do not like basketball <laughs> what about your own community like black gay men mm, let's start yeah, there yeah. is there any pushback or any challenges you face as well that's kind of beyond this whole dating thing yeah, yeah. So there's definitely um, black gay men are such a small group that a lot of those intergroup dynamics, I feel like just as a factor of like, we have to like travel pretty far to find each other. Um, <laughs> but um, for like Pokemon. Yeah, yeah exactly. Found Pokemon one. Go. Yeah, found <laughs> um, yeah, but as far, as far as like other um, gay black men, there's a certain uh, school of thought that actually because of all these sort of uh, reasons that we should not be dating white men. Same gender loving men is sort of a, a term they don't even want to use the term gay because the what? gay the word gay has gotten too just like associated with a certain white um oh, uh, heter- like like stereotype so yeah there there's a group of people who's like you know i'll go on a date with a, a white guy and then they're like why, why are you going on dates with white guys like, mm-hmm. you, like do you hate yourself and like so yeah there's there's some of that and then also think there 
a lot of sort of people like me who are just like, we're rare. We just, you know, find love <laughs> where we can find it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely do get uh, some pushback. So I was talking to um, some of my really good gay friends in New York about, about this topic, about race. Mm-hmm. And they said this observation to me, and I haven't validated it yet, but they said, you see less interracial gay couples than you do sing- or straight couples. Mm. Hmm. There's a yeah. lot less intermixing of races. Yeah, I don't have any statistics, but I would I would definitely agree with that sort of characterization. Even though you said earlier that it's kind of like because you're already in a, like a smaller group, group mm-hmm. you're gonna like expand as many yeah, people yeah, as you, you think can. you want to explore more yeah yeah well i guess when you're white yes. you just sort of have the most options and that's sort of what you go for like when people say interracial in the gay community oftentimes they're saying white with a person of color oh, yeah interesting. that's what yeah yeah uh-huh. so like you know um a latino man and a black man like some people won't even like that won't even register as an interracial relationship just, you know what yeah. that's true <laughs> yeah. if you think about it, the baseline mm-hmm. is white men Mixing with yeah. it really else. is it, right which yeah is, no but if it was like asian and black you would think interracial but i don't know if that's the first thing you that's yeah, the you first label of, yeah, you yeah, go yeah, to yeah. you just be like blasian yeah that's interracial but you just like have another word for that mm-hmm. yeah? Yeah, yeah there is no other word for <laughs> white mix <sighs> should we make one Felicia <laughs> <laughs> just rolls yeah. off the Blasia tongue so well. Is so good. Yeah. White, is, white just doesn't do it. Mm, the yeah. white, <laughs> whack couple. <Yeah. laughs> there we go. We got one. Okay, Wait, what? A whack. Okay. That works. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen a whack couple so in a while. many things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the topic of race is always just so interesting because there's always the external factors, but mm-hmm. then there's all these internal factors, like what you struggle with in terms of identity, preference, yeah. mm-hmm. something that like I can definitely feel as well. I mean, e- even in like the Chinese female community, you have like different groups. You have like the girls who only date white guys, mm-hmm. right? And then you have the group that only dates Asian. Asian guys and mm-hmm. then you have the group that's like looks down on both groups <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's just like so much judgment from mm-hmm. our own people yeah. as well it's weird that it translates into dating so much like dating is about finding love it should be happy it should be like positive right. why are we yeah. putting so much like discrimination and negativity to it no i think attraction is just one of those it's a topic that's so hairy and sort yeah. of like something that no one like ever interrogates i don't want to uh, put out the idea that that people are are intentionally being racist. Right. I think they're just like not thinking about their sort of natural predilections that right. have been influenced by the society. Right. It's not like it's the same situation, but if like women, for example, are like, I only like six foot tall guys yeah. in the th- five and under, like that mm-hmm. is discriminatory yeah, to yeah. those men. It's just not no. race, but it's still like unfair because it's something they can't change like your mm-hmm. race, right? But what about also just men who are bisexual and say mm-hmm. my preference is men? I right. date both, but my preference is men. Can you really argue that? No. Either? Nope. You can't. Yeah. That's what, and that's a lot of people. Yeah. In that <laughs> that actually, out of like all those examples, is probably the one that you can least argue. Right? Like, yeah. hey, yeah. you could be like, really? But nobody, like nobody's mad like, about really? that. Yeah. Nobody's mad about gender. Yeah. I feel like uh, gender has been put into a different silo. Attraction to a certain gender seems more innate to people. Seems right. more sort of, yeah. People joke all the time. It's like gay men are sexist because they don't like women. And like, <laughs> I, I guess, like, <laughs> but if it's not personal, I think that's what it is. Because like, mm. if you like talk about like height or like mm. race, that's like a characteristic about you. Yeah. yeah Where yeah. like, I mean, yes, gender is too, but it's like so broad that it's mm. not like or mm. a sexual preference isn't really you. That's mm. their preference. But I guess you could argue that it could be their it preference can, I mean, it with could be as well. Yeah. yeah. Like you only pansexuals are, are are like yeah. you know the good ones here. <laughs> All the rest of us discriminate. So. I guess everyone yeah. discriminates in some yeah. way, but some are more socially acceptable than others. I mean, isn't that the truth, though? Let's just be honest. That's here, the right? truth. Yeah, that's we the... all have these yeah. discriminations that are mm-hmm. innate in us. Yeah. Some of us have to unlearn them or try to figure out a way to get past them. Yep. Mm-hmm. But it stems from our childhood, it stems yep. from the media, it stems from what we've been taught. I mm-hmm. think some of it, too, isn't just necessarily what you 
feel, but like like I was talking about earlier, like our parents' generation was way more yeah. close minded than us. Like mm-hmm. I think there's some of that that seeped in. That's like from an early age, this is who you should be with, or like this is what a couple looks like, mm, yeah. or like all of that. That's mm. like kind of taught to you subconsciously. So it might not be that like oh I'm actually not attracted to Indian men or Asian men. It just might be like I've kind of like brainwashed that like that yeah. isn't who I'm attracted mm. to. I'm not saying me personally. That's <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, um, I was raised in a, like, I'm a first generation American, so I was uh, raised in a Caribbean immigrant household, mm-hmm. and there were certain religion, uh, Seventh day Adventism, and I was always told, you need to date someone from the Caribbean in that religion, because, oh, other cultures, like, ooh, a cultural problems, you know, mix yep. well, it was never sort of, you know, said as a malicious thing, but they're like, no, you really need to, mm-hmm. but I don't follow any of their advice, obviously. <laughs> they they did <laughs> say women, too, so, um, but like, yeah, that nope. was always... <laughs> but that was always sort of an uh, expectation. Well, right. I think that's yeah. why our the next generation actually has a fighting chance. Yeah. They because do. our yeah. generation actually sees why that was, like, not okay. Yeah. But yeah. that next generation is fucked because of the paradox of choice. They're just yeah. going to be attracted to so many different people. That's true. They have, like, no idea what their preferences are <laughs> yeah. anymore. Right. Yeah. It's just a buffet of people. <laughs> Men, women, everything. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Whatever. It seems like a good problem to have. It's a good problem <laughs> <Yeah>. to have. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about some takeaways, yeah, yeah, from this conversation. Man, these conversations, I feel like they could go on forever because yeah. we can talk about race, <laughs> gender, <laughs> all of this forever. Thorny issues. Yeah. So <laughs> many, so many. But I guess like one of my biggest takeaways, again, is when you think about your own personal preference when it comes to dating, put them in two different categories. One is like the superficial characteristics right. and two is the emotional characteristics, how you want someone to make you feel. And when you start looking for a partner for your lifetime or even for tonight. I yeah. always say we have a type because we've only dated certain people. So right. that's like what you know. Exactly. But what about all the characteristics you haven't dated? You like you have no idea right. if you like someone who's like 5'2". Right. right. And you don't know. Right. Because you haven't dated that person. I think my takeaway is like everyone at the end of the day is a human being. Like I think yeah. anytime we try to put a blanket over someone like one it's just not like a socially great thing to do. Right. But mm-hmm. then also it's kind of like you almost feel like you like know who this person is before you actually meet them. Mm-hmm. So that person isn't who this person has visualized from media or from whatever stereotype they have. Then it falls short. Even if it's not race, that's like not a really great way to go into dating to have a feeling about someone that really has no basis because you've never met the person. Exactly. You know, the other takeaway I have is I love hearing stories from other groups that I don't identify with because yeah. now I'm starting to see that everyone has very similar struggles. Before talking to you, I would have thought gay black men had it pretty good. Same. That would have been what I assumed, right? (laughs) Like that's what the perception I have. Like there's already like this elevated idea of a black man and then you have more of these men (laughs) who want you. I I just thought you would have it pretty good. And so I'm not saying it's great to hear these struggles, Chris, but it's also, it is good because now we can start. It's not so much about like, oh, I can be in your shoes, but it's about empathy. I can, right. I can feel empathy for other people's struggles. And I think sometimes too, it's like, I think part of it is like, there is that like BBC yeah. reference, right? Yeah. Like it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think like a guy that isn't big, right? Would be like, oh, that's a compliment. Like, why are people mm-hmm. upset about that? But then at the end of the day, I think it comes down to like, anytime you are called out for a characteristic that again, may or may not be true right. for you based on like a stereotype like that doesn't sit well and especially if that's the only reason it feels like someone is talking to you yeah if it's not based on your personality or your own unique characteristics it's just purely based on your skin color alone that's just not a good way of complimenting someone right Right. we talked about this on the other episode too if someone comes up to you and says well what did did that guy say i can't even come made a chalk oh i can't even come without a black guy in the room that is not a compliment (laughs) yeah nope the black man in the room could 
could have one right. eye and like <laughs> right. and like as long seven as it's a toes. Man. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you're putting me in the same category as him. Oh, no. Right. Oh. And I think it's like even like the Greek goddess goddess one. It's like a Greek god. <laughs> I could be a goddess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it should be a compliment, but because you're like calling out the race, mm-hmm. it like just doesn't sit well. Exactly. I still remember uh, I had one night stand with someone in New York, and the next day he texted and said, I can't stop thinking about your beautiful Chinese pussy. And I was like, oh. holy shit. Oh. I'm going to cut off your uh. wiener. I thought that was like the most romantic thing he could say to me. Right. You're like, you day. could say anything else. You could else. say anything, anything oh. else. Yeah. And when right. I say one night stand, because I made it a one night stand, <laughs> that like, motherfucker was never going to see me again. Oof. Not good. Not yeah. good. Any other thoughts for us, Chris? Any other like takeaways? Yeah, I take away. I think you guys summed it up uh, pretty well. And I would just say both on my end and on other people's ends, I wish um, as as people dating, we just treat each other as individuals yep. and not members of groups. Yep. The only way to do that is to continue to have open conversations. I think for years, like in our yeah. parents' generation, and even like as of not that long ago, like mm-hmm. people just didn't want to state the obvious. Yeah. Like they didn't want to like bring it up. And it's like, okay, like if there's an elephant in the room, like, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta just address it. Like, you can't just, yeah. like, pretend it doesn't exist. That's, like, worse in a way. Yeah. If I say something offensive, for example, if I say something offensive on this podcast, I would love it if someone wrote to me and said, UA, you said this. It was offensive because of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to hear the explanation. I'm great with criticism and feedback as long as I know where it comes from. Anybody can be ignorant. We just need to know the basis of it. Right. And then we know to change our behavior. Right. It's only when we call out people for saying something offensive by getting mad at them, mm-hmm. by calling them names or showing our anger. It does. It's counterproductive. Right. So we just have to explain why certain things are offensive. Yeah. I don't remember actually who coined this term, but um, I actually like it. Instead of calling people out, you should be calling people in. Oh, so, that's a great yeah, way so to you, it. you should really, you know, say that was wrong. And this is why. And this is like, you know, not have it as an attack on that other person, not yep. just calling them out, but calling them into a discussion with you so you both can learn. And, and in a way, you're pu- pulling them into a circle mm-hmm. of trust here. Yes. Like, I'm going to give you some knowledge. Now you're part of this circle that yeah. knows this knowledge. I right. like that. Calling and people in. And that's, again, opening the conversation up. Really the only way. If you just yell at them, then that's it not opening a conversation. It doesn't yeah. work. Thanks again to Safaya, Yalitza, and Chris for being so open and willing to share their stories with us. To hear their full episodes, you can always go to our show notes where we'll provide some links for Safaya and Yalitza. It's season seven, episode seven, Dating as a Black Woman. And for Chris, it's season eight, episode 13, Sexual Racism. So we leave you with this thought, which is something that Julie and I feel really passionate about which is change will come from building bridges through listening to each other, as opposed to just hearing it from the media. We have to continue to be there for our friends of color, hearing the pain and really listening, not trying to relate our own situations, but rather taking it all in so we can understand more and educate ourselves more. It's not enough to just say, I'm not racist or worse yet, be neutral. What we need to do is to actively stand up for each other and call out when something is wrong. Also, take a deep look within ourselves and see where those prejudices show up. Whether it's 25% of the time or 0.25% of the time, we have to strive to get better every day. Just taking any small step to learn more, educate ourselves more, and just do better goes a long way. So with that said, We at Datable started this podcast because we wanted to create an open platform for people to share their stories, to be heard. And because of that, we encourage all of you to share your stories, your experiences, especially our Black listeners. This is our way of learning more about your pain and your struggle. So please submit a story either by going to our website, datablepodcast.com, or you can email us at hello at datablepodcast.com. All right, let's wrap up this episode. Stay safe, stay open-minded, stay empathetic, and stay datable, everyone. The Datable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? 
first, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Datable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Datable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Thank you.